everybody. This is the Sunday Sports Sermon Edition 2, so please join me. You are my congregation. I am Watu-K99, and I am happy that you're uh, checking the channel out today. All right, so we're going to talk about Mets, Jets, and Rangers today, but since the Rangers have Game 3 of the Eastern Conference Finals this afternoon against the Tampa Bay Lightning, we got to go with the old-school uh, Rangers jersey. You know it's old because there's no shoelace uh, coming, out, coming out over here, and... Yeah, it's a starter logo, too. So, uh, yeah, you know you're old school when you got the starter uh, going on. Uh, let's start off, actually, with the Jets. Uh, I haven't done any Jets content specifically yet since it's kind of the slow season for football. But I do want to uh, give respect to the three uh, Jets legends who have joined the Jets' ring of honor and will be inducted over the course of the season. Darrell Rivas, probably the best cornerback of this generation, and the two stalwarts of the offensive line for 10 years, DeBrickshaw Ferguson and Nick Mangold. Now, as I mentioned, they're all getting separate inductions. But you know what I actually think I would have done differently if I had been in charge of this? Why not push Rivas off one year? You know, because I like him to get like his own spot. But let's be honest, the Jets only have so many players in their history who can be considered worthy of the Ring of Honor, and you don't want to exhaust it too quickly. So why not have Brick and Nick come in together? Induct them on the same day. Think about it. They were drafted together, you know, back in uh, back quite a few years ago, back in 2006, both in the first round. They're joined at the hip. To me, it just makes sense to put both of them in at the same time. Just one thing I would have done differently, and uh, just to show you what a fan I am, I only have two different Jets jerseys right now. Uh, I have a Chad Pennington, I have two Chad Penningtons, and I have a Nick Mangold, but those are the only two players that I currently have. Uh, I did have a Jamal Adams uh, jersey for about a year and a half before everything went sour. That was uh, subsequently donated. So... <laughs> Yeah, the the Jamal Adams jersey did not last as long as the Pennington's or the Mangold. So, wonder who my next jersey purchase will be. Okay, so uh, let's go on to the Mets. I'm going to only spend a moment or two on them. Uh, they are now one and two in L.A. Uh, against the powerhouse Dodgers. One last night, Pete Alonso with two home runs. Pretty fantastic to see. The Dodgers were wearing their uh, janitorial uh, all royal blue uniforms. I gotta say though, with some of these City Connect jerseys that we got going on, have you have you seen some of these? Take a second and go check out the Boston Red Sox City Connect jersey and tell me how that relates to Boston whatsoever. I know they have reasons, but the color schemes are just so crazy that it just it, it just doesn't even seem logical. I don't even mind the Colorado Rockies one that much. Uh, it's all green, but it looks like their license plate and. You know, that one's actually not the worst, but the, they have the Los Dodgers, which is pretty much all royal blue, and it's not the worst alternate jersey that I've seen, except that the regular Dodgers uniforms are just so iconic that uh, any deviation from that just seems strange. But I felt really good about uh, the Mets winning that game. You know, they chased Walker Bueller in the third inning, who's probably the, the Dodgers' best starting pitcher, so that was quite the accomplishment for them to do that. Uh, one thing, though, that was a little bit weird, it was in the ninth inning, there was an 11-minute delay because the Dodgers, who were trailing 9-4 to at the time, tried bringing in a position player to pitch. Now, this is something that teams tend to do quite often when they're being blown out. You know, you want to save your arms in the bullpen. You don't go easy on those guys. So you bring one of your backup position players in, you know, have them toss like a little junk ball, like a little ethos pitch. It takes, you know, the ball takes about a, a day and a half to arrive in the catcher's mitt, right? So they tried this with a backup outfielder who uh, most of us had never heard of, but the umpire said, hold on, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. This isn't how this works. You're not allowed to bring in a position player unless the opposing team is up by six runs or more. The Mets were up five at the time, but the Dodgers didn't know the rule Dave Roberts, the manager, didn't know the deal, and they didn't have anybody else warming up. They thought they were just going to be able to put the pitcher in. Meanwhile, the umpires, they're, they got to enforce this, so they're giving like a little signal to the bullpen. Because by now, the Dodgers have uh, another uh, actual pitcher warming up in the pen. So you can see on camera, they're doing like this. They're giving a little camera uh, signal, like, come on in now. And, uh, he never, and he wasn't coming in. 
So they were telling him to come in. He wasn't he wasn't uh, jogging in, even though we had about 15 warm-up tosses. So two places of blame. you got to blame the Dodgers first and foremost, and specifically Dave Roberts, for not knowing the rule. But the umpires had to do a better job of enforcing the rule in the ninth inning. As a result, there was a, a very needless 11-minute delay. So, yeah, Major League Baseball, if you, if you work in the game, hey, I didn't know the five-run rule. I, I didn't know that, but you know what? It's not my job. I don't work as a baseball manager, and I am not an umpire. All my umpiring experience was one summer at, in Little League, and after that I figured I would move on. So, yeah, know the rules. All right, Mets and Dodgers finished the series later on this afternoon. All right, now, now it's time to get into the Rangers. This is uh, the real meat and potatoes right now of, uh, of what's going on in New York sports. Rangers up 2-0 in the series. This afternoon, they're going to be down in Tampa Bay at the Amelie Arena for Game 3. I have been to that arena. It is beautiful. Uh, the organ that they have there is pretty fantastic. Uh, you know, fans aren't too terrible. Of course, when I was down there, it was like 2014 before the Rangers and Lightning had their uh, very painful Eastern Conference Finals uh, where the Rangers lost Game 7 in Madison Square Garden. I, uh, to, be, to be honest, I don't think the franchise ever really... That was the end of an era, and once that loss happened, I knew that era was over. So, I want, looking at this game, I want to look back at Game 2 for a little bit. Uh, just do a, a brief recap on a couple things that I saw uh, that I don't think are getting enough play. You know, At one point, the Rangers were out shooting Tampa Bay 17-8, to and the Rangers have been getting outshot all season, all se really all playoffs long, but really in the regular season, they don't get the most shots on goal. Now, it helped that they had a couple of power play attempts, uh, but we're used to seeing the Rangers being outshot, you know, maybe getting 75 to 80 percent of the, the opposing shots. It just shows how they are really controlling the play in this series. Tampa Bay is not matching up with the Rangers' speed. You know, when the Rangers play Carolina, Carolina plays a really defensive-focused system, a very defensive style of hockey. The Rangers did not have that space to skate into the lightning uh, or into the hurricane zone. And that's why guys like Artemi Panarin and Mika Zibanejad and Chris Kreider did as little as they did. Now, they eventually did some uh, good stuff in Game 7. But that was really the theme of the series. You know, the Hurricanes had most of the time of possession. That has not been the case against Tampa Bay. They are not skating with the Rangers. They are struggling to keep up, which doesn't make sense considering they had, and you've heard ESPN hammer this to death, nine days off after they swept the Florida Panthers. So uh, a couple things about the game, though, specifically. The penalty on Ryan Reeves to me was ridiculous. He and Pat Maroon got into a, a little bit of a friendly tussle. You know, we've seen worse. And they kind of pulled on each other's jersey. But Reeves gets two minutes for slashing. There was nothing egregious about anything that he did. But it gave Tampa Bay a very early power play. that uh, they It just didn't make any sense to me why, why that was even called. So, uh, yeah, the officiating was very bizarre. Of course, every team thinks that the officials are biased against them. But, but to me, that just made no sense. It should have been coincidental minors or no minor penalties at all. Mark Messier and Chris Chelios said as much during the intermission. Uh, another thing that was uh, that is uh, striking to me is just how close Alexei Lafreniere is to scoring a goal in the in the playoffs. He's had one. He's now he hasn't been shut out. But Philip Hedl is the one who's gotten all the attention. You know, he scored seven goals. Capo Caco is starting to get on the score sheet lately. But Lafreniere, he is just making those dirty plays against the boards. He said, I think, two or three posts in the last two games. He is right there on the edge of breaking out. I really think before this series is over, Lafreniere is going to score a big goal, number 13. So I'm going to call, uh, I'm going to call that one right now. And uh, if I, I guess to throw something out, oh, the other thing I want to throw in is Anthony Sorelli. With the, his cross-check with uh, Lightning Center, Anthony Sorelli, with a dirty cross-check on Ryan Strom. Strom was down on his knees facing the boards, and Sorelli takes a stick, you know, with both hands, and hits him, from, hits him from behind and knocks him into the boards. It was shown on ESPN. It was not mentioned. There was no penalty. And to me, that was checking from behind. Sorelli should have absolutely gotten a penalty there as well. And uh, oh, and, and another thing I got to talk about just real quick with these celebrities who are showing up at the games. Uh, Brian Dable, the new Giants head coach, he seems like he's really into it. He's the, he's there every game. I don't think the Rangers have lost a playoff game that he's attended. 
And he seems kind of into it. You know, he seems like kind of the big blue collar guy, guy you want to go have a beer with, that sort of a thing. But now he's bringing Joe Shane, the new Giants general manager, to the game, who also came over from Buffalo this offseason. And oh my gosh, it, Joe Shane looks like the biggest hockey geek I've ever seen. He does, he looks so out of place. Like he's waving the white towel like this, and it just looks so ridiculous. He looks like a farm boy in a video arcade. It, it makes absolutely no, he just doesn't even know what's going on. I, I would just like to go up to him and say, hey, Joe, can you explain the two line pass for me? I don't think he'd be very knowledgeable with that. And there's another thing we're going to talk about. And I want to talk about the Tampa goalie, Andre Vasilevsky. With, with everybody's prediction going into this series, one thing that I don't think anybody expected was the substandard play of Tampa goalie Andre Vasilevsky, widely considered to be one of the best, if not the best, goalies in the league. He's a four-time All-Star. He's won a Vesna Trophy as the best goalie in the league. He's won the Conn Smythe Trophy. He won the Conn Smythe just last year as the MVP of the entire Stanley Cup playoffs. And in the last round, the four-game sweep over the President's Cup Trophy winning Florida Panthers, he allowed three goals, less than a goal per game. Three goals in four games. So coming into this, what did we hear from all the experts? Oh, all well, the Rangers, they played Louis Domingue and Casey DeSmith and Auntie Ranta and Peter Kajorkovic, uh, whoever the third Carolina goalie was. The Rangers only had one game out of the 14 where they played the opponent's team's perceived number one goalie, which was Tristan Jari, and he was just coming off a, a full month out from a broken foot. And they beat him game seven uh, in overtime when Artemi Panarin scored the game-winning goal. But that narrative was gone now because now the Rangers had to face Vasilevsky. Oh, now it's going to change. Now the Rangers are going to see what a real goaltender is all about. Well... It's not going quite so well for uh, for Andre. He's allowed uh, nine goals in uh, two games. In game one, though, this is what was interesting. The Rangers scored six goals, but four of them were on the high blocker side. Now, those of you who may not be the be a big hockey fan, you have the goal. The goalie has uh, two hands. You have the glove side and you have the blocker side. So the blocker hand is the one where you hold the stick. So Vasilevsky's uh, glove hand is his left hand. So his right hand is the blocker side. Okay, so that's where he's holding the stick. And that's where he's been vulnerable. That's the side the Rangers have been targeting, and it has worked. Four of those six goals were scored on the high blocker side. So it's like under the arm or uh, by the, the right hip, above the leg pad. That's what they've been targeting, and that's what's worked. Uh, Vasilevsky has a save percentage rate during the whole season of about 78-79% on that right side, on that midsection on the right side. The glove side, the left side on the other hand, it's 89%. Same body part, different side, and the difference is about a 10% in save, uh, in, save in save percentage. It is crazy. So, you know, the Rangers had all this time to prepare for Tampa Bay. Now, they were playing, but they knew who their opponent was going to be. Okay, so what I'm thinking is the Rangers scouts said, okay, figure out Vasilevsky, and of course, figure out Victor Hedman, figure out Steven Stamkos, Nikita Kucherov, where are their weaknesses? And I'm willing to bet these guys came back, the scouting came back and told Gerard Gallant and the players, target the blocker side high, mid and high. That is what they were doing. So, one, so here's what I would say. Focus on the Rangers are going to want to be on their right hand side, okay? So on Vasilevsky's left, uh, Va I'm sorry, Vasilevsky's right, Rangers side left. That is where they're aiming the puck. So you want to look for where the stick is, and that's where they want to shoot the puck because that's when the puck has the best chance of going in. So let's see if they can do that in game three and game four when the series shifts down to Tampa Bay. Okay, so that's uh, what I've got uh, for you today. Uh, if you're enjoying the content, Please like, please subscribe, and you know, tell a friend about it. Share it with somebody on social media. If you know a Mets fan, a Jets fan, a Rangers fan, a New York sports fan who uh, might like the content, that would be fantastic. I'll talk to you all next time, and have a great day.